4,000 Week Time Management for Mortals by Oliver Berkman. Wonderful book. Now, I know a number of the people who are attending today's workshop have also read it and also loved it. It's been described by Adam Grant, uh, no less, as the most important book ever written about time management. Dan Pink said, this profound and often hilarious book will prompt you to rethink your worship of efficiency, re reject the cult of busyness, and reorganize your life around what truly matters. It's had a lot of high praise. I can highly endorse it. And uh, I, what we're going to do today is I'm going to share 10 of the most impactful ideas that I took from this book. But, you know, it's got a lot more than 10 ideas. It's also a very beautiful book. The language that Oliver uses to describe this topic is uh, very amusing, uh, very moving. So, look, for those of you who don't know me on the course, uh, on this webinar, I should say, uh, my name is Eric Winters, and I work in organizations to help people to have better conversations at work. What kind of conversations? Well, coaching conversations, in which we help people to help others to uh, learn, grow, and think for themselves. Uh, collaborative conversations. We're in an age now in which we know we need to embrace diversity, but we need to create contexts in which people can have the conversations with each other and hear what we're saying to one another. And also, I help people to have difficult conversations, the challenging conversations that perhaps we'd, sometimes we'd, we'd rather not have, but the conversations we need to have. So, moving right on. The first idea in this book, Time Management for, uh, time management for Mortals, 4,000 Weeks. That's key idea, absolutely fundamental, is that life is short. How short? Well, about 4,000 weeks. It's in the title of the book. Now, 4,000 is a bit of a tricky number to get your head around. I don't know if you feel like, well, oh, that's, that's quite a lot, or that's quite a little. But sometimes what can help with numbers is not to think of them as a number, but to look at them graphically. Here's what 4,000 Excel cells look like. Now that's it, 4,000, 52 across and about 80 or 85 down. So for each week that you live, that you, live you can imagine filling out one of those cells and moving on and moving on. None of these weeks are replaceable, right? Every week we get, we get it once. Now, this, the situation is, is somewhat worse than I've been making out. And people who have read my book, uh, Swipe Right and Your Best Self, will know that there are some other uh, serious predicaments to being a human. So one, we know, we're aware that we've got this end. But two, we might not actually get all the way to the end. You know, not all of us are going to get 80, 85, 90, 95 years of life. For some of us, it could be next week. We might just get one more week instead of another two or 3,000. But it's worse than that. So not only might we not get all of our weeks, but the energy and vitality that we have in our weeks is not equally distributed. It's probably fair to say for most people on the call today, you have more vitality today, more energy, than you will ever have in the rest of your life. Because vitality tends to kind of drop off. Now, certainly you can, you can go out for runs and you can sleep well and you can do your best to boost your vitality. But overall, it's going to take something of a, a downward slope towards the end. Now, that should be enough, but it's even worse than that. Because our perception of time changes as we age. As perhaps you know, as perhaps some of you on the call here will know. In fact, perhaps you could just type in the chat box if you've experienced this. Time pass seems to pass faster as you age. When we were young, if you could just pop in a, a quick yes, or if that's, yep, Monica, you've experienced that. I certainly have. Yes, Jenny. Isn't it unfair? 
it's unfair. Carlos, great to have you here as well. <laughs> Look, this is dreadful. As time goes on, <laughs> as we move towards the end, our perception of life constricts. It, it, it dials down. My goodness. So our vitality decreases, and it feels like the limited time we have left is accelerating. Youth is wasted on the young, Jenny. You're just, you're right. You're so right. So life is short. That's all we've got. And when we get to the end, there is a deadline. There is a real deadline. There is nothing more. So this is the context we're in. So what do you think most people do in this situation? Here's our situation. We've only got a, number, a small number of non-replaceable weeks. What do most people do in this circumstance? Well, I'll put it to you that a lot of people do this. They avoid the truth. When the topic comes up about death and how much time we've got left, People just don't want to know about it. They'll say, oh, that's morbid. Now, what's the point of dwelling on that? They'll put it out of mind. But it's never fully out of mind. You know, we're all kind of aware of this. It's hovering in the background. And there are, there are many ways in which we avoid confronting this truth. There, are, there have never been more potential distractions available to us than there are today. You can distract yourself with work, distract yourself with alcohol, distract yourself with sex. And that's just my top three. You'll have your own favorite ways of distracting yourself. So perhaps in the uh, chat box, just quickly, well, what are your go-tos? If you are feeling stressed, worried about something, where might you Go. How might you busy yourself or occupy yourself so as not to think about something that's a bit uncomfortable? Twitter, Sally. Yeah, I've spent, I've frittered away a lot of time. Netflix, Tina. Yes, it's. Have you seen Sex, Death, and Robots? It's, it's absolutely fabulous on Netflix. Uh, it's it's sort of a distraction, but it's also brilliant. Food, Karen. Yes, me me too. I love those family bags of deli chips, the uh, sea salt ones. My goodness. Reading, Joanne, that's very uh, honourable. Spend time on online, Maria. Exercise, that's good. We can lose ourselves in all sorts of things. Constantly thinking, hiding about how we can make changes. Yes, look, we've got so many different strategies available to us. Just, and Greg, yes, watching the news nowadays can make us feel better about ourselves. At least we're not in that particular war zone or in that particular country. Uh, in the book, the author Oliver Berkman mentions that there are three really key things that make social media especially toxic. The first one, he says, is that when we spend time uh, online, we're, we don't recognize it, but we're paying for that time. Whoops, we're going the wrong way. We're paying for that time with our life. Those, the minutes, remember, we don't have, we can't replace these weeks we've got on that spreadsheet. We're actually paying for our time with, on social media with our very lives. So sometimes it's just not a very good use of our, of our limited time of life on earth. But secondly, our time on social media actually retrains us. We are being trained when we're on social media and we're being trained to value different things. So the world of social media is telling you this is important. It's important that maybe you look this way or that you have, you have these things. Maybe that you're, you're, you're extremely popular or extremely good looking or that you stay youthful. It trains us about what we should think about. But it also, it trains us in a way that diminishes the quality of our attention. We become more distractible. The more time we spend online, the more our ability to focus and choose where we spend our attention is eroded. Then thirdly, another downside of spending time on social media is that although we may not recognize it, even when we disconnect from Twitter, from whatever, uh, Dig, uh, Facebook, Instagram, 
whenever we, even though we disconnect at some point, a part of our mind is still thinking about it. So actually we're still thinking about it. That content is spilling over into the rest of our life as well. It's problematic. <laughs> now don't log off, Maria. Stay online. This doesn't count as frittering away our precious life. This is time well spent. <laughs> this will be time well spent, I hope. So a, a point that uh, Oliver makes again and again in the book, and Oliver isn't a coach or a psychologist, but he says, you know what, guys? One of the biggest problems is our unwillingness to stay with discomfort. He says, we've got to get better at tolerating discomfort. A lot of things that happen in life, good things that happen in life, are going to involve some discomfort. We don't want to move too quickly into soothing ourselves. And isn't it easy now to soothe ourselves? Uh, there's distractions just a, a click away. Next thing that we do to try and make ourselves feel better is to give ourselves the illusion, and it's an illusion, that we're in control. There's three ways we try to do this. We tell ourselves, oh, look, I'm going to allow myself to uh, feel peace of mind just as soon as I've got control. And I only need to do three things to get peace of mind when I'm in control. And here's how I'm going to do it. Number one, I am going to feel, I'm going to complete all my to-do lists. I'm going to get everything done. I'm going to clear the decks so there's nothing in my in-tray. That's the first strategy. Was anyone ever tried emptying your email? Have you tried it? I, I like to do it just for the, the pleasure that those first 15 seconds give you. It's lovely that there's nothing there for a, a few moments. But the truth is we cannot get everything done in life. We will never, none of us are ever going to get everything done. It's a bit like thinking, oh, I want to get all the laundry done for good. No. Or all the washing up. I want it all done for good forever. No, isn't going to happen. The second thing we, we do, and this dreadful bargain we have us, with ourselves, is we say, look, I'm going to give myself peace of mind. Not yet, but as soon as I'm fully competent, as soon as I'm fully across everything I'm doing, then, then I will have peace of mind. This is another doomed strategy because even the most competent people in life, in every domain, you may know this, they don't feel competent. The only people who feel competent are the incompetent. The better you get at anything in any discipline, the more you'll recognize that there's more to learn, that you haven't got, you haven't completely mastered it. There are no masters. There are none then we might also strike a bargain with ourselves that says, no, I'll give myself peace of mind as soon as I'm fully confident. Everybody seems to want confidence. I want confidence. Then I can have peace of mind. I need to be confident that my relationships won't have any problems, that my work situation will continue to improve, that the economic climate will continue to get better, and there'll be no more pandemics. Now, this is tragic because we cannot be confident about very much in life at all, except perhaps for change, and that there will be more pandemics, there will be more economic upheaval, and there will be more problems in our relationships at work and at home. We are never going to ex achieve full competence, and we will never get everything done. This is a doomed strategy, trying to feel in control. Now, Oliver has a nice thing to say about our vain attempts to get everything done. Because you'll know from time to time we have new technologies arrive. And you might think of microwave ovens or dishwashers or even washing machines. And at the time, every time these new technologies arrived, people would claim, futurists would say, look, this is going to free up an extra half a day, a day and a half every week. People are going to have so much leisure time in the future. They're going to have so much time free because they're saving so much time. And none of it has ever happened. No one has ever had an extra minute. We use it for something else. We don't have any extra leisure time. Oliver says the technologies we use to try to get on top of everything always fail us in the end because they increase the size of the everything on which we're trying to get on top. 
He's so right. So it's a doom strategy. We can't do everything. He says another problem we have is to try to maintain a sense of being in control and well-being is to keep our options open. Now, it's a curious thing about the human mind, but if you've got multiple options, say for a career or a relationship, business you want to think about starting, the human mind, while it has multiple possibilities, oh, I could do A or B or C or D or E, a part of the human mind imagines a future in which you have all those futures at the same time. If I could do A, B, C, D, or E, ah, oh, and it thinks you could have them all. Of course, you can't have them all. Oliver says we've got to stop keeping our options open. We need to choose. We need to settle and commit. We need to make commitments. And he says it's uncomfortable, but it's better if we make commitments that we can't back out of. Irreversible commitments. Invest yourself wholeheartedly in a small number of projects. Don't try to keep your options open. Settle. The result of these poor strategies we have to try and appease ourselves, the avoidance, trying to be in control, get everything done, is a lot of people live lives of joyless urgency. And they're forever leaning into the future, telling themselves that look, my real life, the, the life for which I meant, it will begin very soon. Not yet. And a lot of people use the present moment and they value this moment primarily as a stepping stone, a stepping stone to a better future. That this isn't it right here. This isn't my life. But if I just get things ticked off, if I can just become competent enough, if I can just become confident, then, then my future, my real life, then it can begin. And this is tragic because we're all living our lives right now. This is it. So the challenge, Oliver says, is we need to somehow stop leaning excessively and it's, it's good to plan, it's good to look ahead, but leaning excessively and deferring our well-being to the future. We've got very good at deferring well-being, making it conditional upon impossible hurdles. Instead, we need to be able to bring ourselves back and actually spend more time here and now. The solution, Oliver says, to... Uh, this predicament we find ourselves in is that we need to have a much more authentic relationship with life. Here's what he says. It is only by facing our finitude that we can step into a truly authentic relationship with life. It is by consciously confronting the certainty of death that we finally become truly present for our lives. And becoming truly present for our lives is the goal. To do this, we need to accept our limitations. We can't do everything in our 4,000 weeks. We're going to have to choose. We're going to have to make compromises and trade-offs. We're going to have to settle. And so rather than trying to do everything, pick a small number of personally meaningful projects and invest yourself wholeheartedly in that. He says, taking the bigger picture, it's not just possible that you might miss out on life. It's absolutely certain that you're going to miss out on practically everything that life has to offer. Because there are just too many different places to visit, too many different books to read, too many different skills to learn, too many different people that you could have relationships with, too many different foods to taste. We cannot do it all. We're going to have to pick and choose and savor and relish. We need to live a life of honesty and accepting our limitations. So there's a, a figure that has some advice about this and the uh, a philosopher. And this philosopher is a cat in the hat. And what the cat in the hat tells us is it's fun to have fun. 
but you have to know how. Now, if you ask people, do you know how to have fun? They will. I'm sure they'll say, well, of course I know how to have fun. But most people don't know how to have fun. They know how to seek relief from stress. They know how to drink and to forget their worries. They know how to eat to distract themselves. They know how to avoid discomfort. But not as many people are really good at coming to the present moment and savoring and tasting and enjoying things that are meaningful and important to them. Now, there's a skill. Luckily, we were talking earlier on about this leaning into the future, always planning ahead. Luckily, coming back to the present is a skill that everyone can develop. Everyone can get better at being here now. And it's an, atten it's an attentional skill. It's attentional training. A lot of you on the call I know are already fans of mindfulness. And mindfulness is just training your mind to use your attention with intention. There are a lot of apps out there to help people to do this. I've, I've checked out an awful lot of them. Can I just let you know that right now, my favorite mindfulness app is one called 10% Happier. 10% Happier. And like all of these apps, you get a, a period which, which you can try it out for free. I was very, very impressed. I stayed on and I paid for the full subscription. What I especially love about this mindfulness app is that the language that it uses is so straightforward and ordinary. I'm go I actually, right now I'm, I'm running a program developing emotional intelligence in a large organization. And I've recommended that everyone, all of these serious professionals, these hard nosed, very logical, rational people, I've recommended this app because the language that it uses is so straightforward. It's accessible. So I'd just like to mention that to you. 10% happier. Give it a whirl. What's next? Oliver recommends that what can help us <laughs> accept our situation is some cosmic insignificance therapy. He says, we all suffer from something called an egocentricity bias. We kind of think we're at the middle of things and that almost all of history has been leading up to us. Oh, that, that it's leading up to us, that we are, we are the point of it all. Of course, it's not true. We are not nearly as important as we might imagine. But this is a good thing, because when you imagine that you are supremely and cosmically and universally important, creates a very high bar for having a meaningful life. If you're going to do something that has a global impact, well, you're going to have to be a super achiever. He says that's, that's a path to despair. If we can spend some time even just looking up at the stars, recognizing how small we are and, importantly, how brief we are, we can lower our bar for what we want to achieve in life and still uh, achieve a life of greater meaning and greater joy because it's achievable. So he says, pick personally important goals, personally important goals. Go for them, just a few of them. Create your own purposes. Don't wait for some divine figure to beam down to you your, your one true destiny. Don't wait for that. Uh, instead, design some, a small number of personally meaningful purposes. Next, he finishes the book asking some questions. And here's just a couple of the questions. I mentioned earlier on that he said that one of our biggest problems is that we're kind of unwilling to sit with discomfort, the discomfort of having a finite life, but also the discomfort of, of, of starting a new business, having a relationship, getting fit. All good things in life, everything worthwhile requires being with discomfort. So here's one of his first questions. Where in life are you pursuing comfort when what is called for perhaps is a little discomfort? So perhaps in the chat box, would anyone be willing to say where in your life, hand on your heart, might you be pursuing comfort? I might just chip in, you know, I, I could change my diet. I think there's there's quite a lot of comfort uh, eating at the moment in my diet. But where in your world? Yes, Sally, 
you too. We're not alone. There's a few of us. No, it's a popular one, this. Oh, exercise moniker. Sure. I might put that on my list too, actually. These things require some discomfort. Anyone holding back in business, perhaps? So there are some uncomfortable uh, conversations to be had. We need to be willing to recognize this, own it, and accept a little more discomfort. Oh, good for you, Jenny. Lovely. Oh, and a lot of discomfort, but you're doing okay. Great to hear that. And thank you for uh, sharing that. Wonderful. I, I've got a lot of admiration for people who give up drinking. It's, uh, it's something at the back of my mind, but it's just at the back. Study plan. Yes. Reaching out to others more. Lots of things. Here is one more question. One more question. In which areas of life have you been holding back until you feel like you know what you're doing? In, and we all do this if we're honest with ourselves. In what area of life have you been holding back until you really feel like you know what you're doing? I was on an education treadmill for the longest time. Two master's degrees and multiple year-long uh, training projects in all sorts of disciplines. And it was all in a vain effort to become fully competent. That's great to have learned so much, but the motivation was to become fully com uh, com uh, competent, to feel fully competent. So look, we've covered a number of things here. Here's the summary. We've talked at the beginning about life being short. And my question to you in a moment, not just yet, but out of these 10 ideas that I've shared, which one do you think, if you were to take it to heart, might make the biggest positive impact to you? Is it owning that actually life is short? There is only a certain amount and it's kind of rushing ahead. Is it owning your avoidance strategies, the places you go to avoid discomfort? Is it accepting that your strategies for being in control haven't, uh, are doomed to fail and it's time to give them up? Have you been keeping too many options open? Have you been leaning into the future, uh, missing out on the present? Is it time to have an authentic relationship with our situation? Are you willing to li limit, to uh, accept, accept your limitations and not being able to do everything and having to choose? Or is it being here now, getting better, being in the present, training your mind to come back to the present, to experience your life as it's unfolding? Or are you willing to have some cosmic insignificance therapy and recognize how, just how small we are? Or might it be one of the two better questions? But in the chat box, I'd love to hear which one of these ideas do you think, if you were to take it to heart, might make the biggest difference to you? Control Greg. Greg, great. Thank you very much. Yeah, I've spent a lot of time uh, trying to do that. Rashan, you too. Trying to be in control. Life's short, Rachel. It is short. We do need to live it while, while we still have it. Accepting limitations, Tina. Jadette, realize running out of time. Yeah, time to, yes, to really choose. Really choose what is important. That's the most important thing. We need to choose, not have others choose for us. What are we going to decide is really important. Others settling, Jenny, Joanne, picking a small number of personally meaningful projects. Lovely. And yes, emphasis on the small number. Invest yourself wholeheartedly in just a small number. Dan, stop keeping quite so many options open. Yeah, go for it. Look, Rick, people do go for the book. Do go for it. It's a great book, a wonderful book. It's beautifully written. It's, uh, it's, it's a slightly philosophical read, which, which I love. A lot of important ideas. Thank you all for attending. I hope so this has been useful, and I hope you will take one or more of those ideas to heart and allow it to positively impact your brief life. Enjoy the rest of the day.